we recording? Okay. So today I'm going to talk about inflammatory psychosis or more specifically more uh, in, in a more refined way, I'm going to talk about a, a hypothesis that schizophrenia symptoms or psychosis symptoms can arise through inflammation. Uh, this is part of a series of lectures which talks about uh, different uh, major hypotheses for schizophrenia cause. We have up to this point covered dopamine psychosis. Last week we covered glutamate psychosis, and today we're going to cover what I call infl inflammatory psychosis. Um, as an aside, I think that there's a tremendous amount of evidence that a lot of scientists are buying into and saying that schizophrenia is not a single disease, it's multiple diseases with multiple causes, they just look the same on the surface. And indeed, drugs have been telling, this, have been telling us this for 60 years. Um, not everybody responds the same way to the same drug, and to a pharmacologist, this is primary evidence. Uh, to suspect that there are different physiologies underneath uh, the system in which the drug is interacting. So I, that's why I like to call it inflammatory psychosis because I think it's uh, more helpful to think of schizophrenia is in, in this fashion, and that fashion being of multiple illnesses. So um, I'm just gonna go, I'll throw out some just examples of why I think this is a very interesting topic. This is, this is a very interesting topic. Ultimately, this is going to be a very high yield area of investigation. Uh, right now, inflammation, if anybody studies inflammatory pathways, they'll know that it's to say that it's incredibly complex is an understatement. So we have a lot to work out, but clearly there is a there there when it comes to inflammation and psychosis. Um, in, the, in the email that I sent out to invite people to today's talk, I gave the example from a story that appeared in New York Times in around September 2018 of a man with schizophrenia um, who later developed cancer. And throughout all of this, the treatments for schizophrenia were marginally effective. As part of his cancer therapy, he underwent a bone marrow transplant. And a bone marrow transplant obliterates the living, the person's living bone marrow and replaces it with somebody else's bone marrow. In the process, uh, one gets a whole bunch of new immune cells, of, of T cells and B cells specifically. And following this um, sort of transplant of his immune system, the individual had no more symptoms of his psychosis. Uh, so, um, People presented this article and discussed it as, isn't that amazing? Um, actually, if you, if you understand that there is a subset of people with schizophrenia who have an inflammatory psychosis, it's not amazing at all. It's actually really, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the nice thing is that it worked, but it's not surprising if, if one had an inflammatory disease all along. Um, at probably at some point during the course of the year, I'll give a lecture about um, celiac disease masquerading as schizophrenia. There are two very interesting case reports um, with the very same story of individuals who have symptoms that look textbook schizophrenia. Um, they were given years of antipsychotic medications with no significant benefit. Um, following those several years of failed antipsychotic treatment for a presumed schizophrenia, um, gastrointestinal symptoms arose, which led ultimately to the diagnosis of celiac disease. And when the patients were given gluten-free diets, they had a remission of their symptoms that had formerly been called schizophrenia. Again, this is another example of an, infl of an inflammatory process leading to symptoms which were identical to schizophrenia and which according to the DSM were properly labeled schizophrenia. It's just, it wasn't dopamine psychosis. Um, uh, from my own case files, um, I was taking care of a, of a young man in a state hospital, and he had um, amongst the worst cases of thought disorganization I had ever seen. Um, he would talk very fluently, um, but it was extraordinarily difficult to try to understand what point he was trying to make. I mean, it was, it was, it was impressive. Uh, this individual developed a really, really bad lung infection, which uh, sent him to the hospital. And when he came back, uh, this man was completely lucid. Um, he told me, he actually, he told me, you know, I say things and I can tell by you all's facial expression that you're not understanding me. So I try to re-explain them and then I see that you still don't understand me and the, the whole thing is very frustrating for me. He said that. <laughs> 
in a very organized way. Um, this was in the aftermath of a, of a massive immune response to, to, that his body has mounted to cure himself of pneumonia. Sadly, he faded back into uh, what I think is probably better called fluent aphasia um, within about a week of his return. Uh, but he had this window of um, complete lucidity. So this is, uh, if, we could, if we could capture whatever his immune system was doing, that would have been a permanent solution for him, but it exemplifies again an inflammatory pathway to something that, by the book, would be definite would be defined as schizophrenia. And a lot of people don't know this, but uh, a psychiatrist won a Nobel Prize in the 1930s, and the prize was given for the discovery that one can deliberately infect patients with malaria, um, and in so doing, you can alleviate symptoms of psychosis, which are secondary to tertiary syphilis. Uh, so, um, the, the, it seems if I just say he won a Nobel Prize for infecting people with malaria, it sounds horrible, but there was actually a, a thought process behind this and based upon the realization that when people mount fevers, when people with psychotic symptoms are febrile, um, in many cases their psychotic symptoms will be in remission. So given that observation from the clinic, the pathway was to try to figure out ways to induce fever responses. And it turns out amongst the available options in, 19, in the early 20th century, um, giving the weakest form of malaria uh, was probably the most effective way of doing this because um, it produces the highest fever for the longest time. And also back in those days, you could effectively get rid of the malaria by giving them a quinine. So uh, some narrative examples uh, to point out that inflammation as a cause of psychosis is, is a big thing. Um, I, I will point out to anybody who listens that somewhere between 5% to more than 10%, so let's say 7%, of people with a first episode of what we call schizophrenia actually have a medical disease which is masquerading as schizophrenia. So between less five and 10% of people actually have a medical disease. Many of those medical diseases that are uh, occult causes of schizophrenia are inflammatory diseases. Uh, so this is a list of some common, commonly seen inflammatory conditions uh, that can lead to initial symptoms which get misrecognized as schizophrenia. Uh, this argues very strongly for doing a thorough medical workup and for including markers of inflammation in that workup. Um, so the other, the flip side of that coin is that um, immune diseases can cause psychosis reliably and maybe a bit paradoxically, if you look at all people with schizophrenia, they very rarely have rheumatoid schizophrenia. They have, I was gonna say rheumatoid schizophrenia. They very rarely have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is a curious finding. It seems that um, nobody knows exactly how to interpret it. In my simplistic way, um, I like to think that uh, the immune response is directed against neural tissue, and because the body is directing all the inflammation against brain tissue, um, it has little left to attack joints. But that's just me trying to make sense of this curious observation. Um, other evidence of inflammation, uh, some very interesting studies show that, it, that C-reactive protein levels in adolescents can reasonably predict a uh, significantly elevated risk of schizophrenia later in life. Um, specifically, if you, had, if you were in the upper third of CRP levels when you were a teenager, um, that would correspond to an increased risk of between six and 11 fold over baseline. Uh, later in life. Uh, and just to be complete, C-reactive protein is a, a sensitive, a nonspecific but very sensitive marker of systemic inflammatory response. Um, if you need further evidence uh, for that, for, for an role of inflammation, I'll direct you to this very interesting study uh, from Switzerland. And in to my mind, amazingly, at this particular hospital in Switzerland, every single person that comes in with a new episode of schizophrenia gets a lumbar puncture. They have a cerebrospinal fluid removed, um, and that uh, cerebrospinal fluid is, you know, part of it is screened for various things and part of it is banked. Uh, so they simply got 180 people in sequential order, new admissions, and they did spinal taps, and they found that over half had antibodies directed against neural tissue. Uh, so again, it's, it's a big, it's clearly a thing. What to do with that information becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. 
Uh, so this, the low hanging fruit in this hypothesis is if inflammation, if heightened inflammation is a relevant cause of schizophrenia like symptoms, then giving people anti-inflammatory drugs should make them better. That is the, as I said, the lowest hanging fruit from this hypothesis. But, uh, but it sort of works. Um, in this meta-analysis, I'll show you some figures. Looking at aspirin, which is a, um, we'll call broad spectrum anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, what I mean by that specifically is that um, aspirin can inhibit both types of cyclooxygenase, COX-1 and COX-2. Um, so as far as those targets, aspirin covers them all. Um, and the, the data are reasonable um, for a signal of efficacy. So um, this shows a meta-analysis on the the graph we're looking at effect sizes with confidence intervals. Main points is that uh, two of those bars um, don't cross the zero line, and uh, the effect size on average is about 0.3. So not the most robust of effect sizes, but for all comers um, with schizophrenia, adding aspirin to them um, on average seems to further reduce their symptoms of schizophrenia. There's an important caveat to that, which so don't go prescribing aspirin based on this yet um, until you hear the other side of the coin in a few slides. So aspirin being the so-called broad spectrum, a COX-1, COX-2 inhibitor, um, and also hard on the stomach, uh, led to trying to narrow in the studies on celecoxib, which is a specific COX-2 inhibitor. Uh, COX-2 is much more predominant in the brain, so it makes sense to study the COX-2 inhibitor as a, as a schizophrenia treatment. And um, COX-2 is much less present in the stomach, so on average, people have a lot less GI upset with it. Um, and overall, um, there's a signal for efficacy, at least from some studies, and some studies not. Uh, so I, you know, the, the bottom line is that it's mixed, uh, a mixed signal. And if you average all the studies in the red bar at the bottom, you'll see maybe a little bit bigger than zero in terms of efficacy, but um, not a clear signal. So from the two studies, aspirin looks like the better drug. Um, and by the way, then aspirin, uh, according to Dutch health insurance data from the Netherlands, um, any exposure of NSAID in medical record uh, translates to a statistically significant lowering uh, that that individual will have ever had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So any use of NSAID in, as, as a prescribed intervention in a medical record uh, actually translates to a lower risk of um, schizophrenia. So as I said, don't everybody jump to aspirin aspirin prescribing right yet because um, it, it actually makes psychosis worse in some cases. A number, a, a number of case reports from different places in the world at different times have said that there are some individuals who take nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, what have you, indomethacin, and uh, immediately following ingestion experience hallucinations or paranoia. Um, I was reading this many, many years ago and I never, I thought it was Curious, I never heard about that. I gave a lecture uh, to a fairly large audience one time. I pointed this out, and then uh, an audience member came up to me afterwards and said, "Thank you for explaining that because every time I take ibuprofen, I never, I never take ibuprofen anymore because it, it, I got, I got, I got paranoid and hallucinated." So um, you know, they're 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 out there, uh, and unfortunately, although clearly there's some connection between inflammation and psychosis, uh, the arrow of causality or whether it's all the same for all patients has uh, yet to be fully determined. So what can a clinician take home from this? I think the first and foremost, I go back to between five and 10% of people with an initial onset of schizophrenia actually have a medical disease which is causing those symptoms. So schizophrenia is defined as a diagnosis of exclusion. Specifically, you can't call it schizophrenia if you can call it anything else in terms of medical disease. So every person with a new onset of schizophrenia needs a complete comprehensive medical neurological and laboratory workup, and those workups should include uh, screens for inflammation. The easiest way is to measure C-reactive protein or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Uh, the bonus way would be to screen for some antibody panels. They're about $50 per antibody panel screen, so it's not like we're breaking the bank by doing this. Uh, but for looking for things like antibodies for celiac disease, antibodies for anti-thyroiditis, antibodies uh, for 
uh, NMDA receptors. Um, all of those are out there as known causes of schizophrenia like psychosis. So however one decides to go looking for inflammation, one should go looking for that inf inflammation. And if CS, if the C-reactive protein or the sedimentation rate, the global screens um, are elevated, then the clinician should not stop uh, do, should not stop that workup until those elevations have been adequately explained. Um, on average, um, giving patients with schizophrenia a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug might be better than giving them nothing. But um, again, if you if 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 one initiates this practice and then hears that things aren't getting better or getting worse, then keep in mind that they may worsen. They may, between, they, may be, they, they may be between ineffective to harming uh, some individuals. And um, I think those are all the comments that I have on.